more delightful to come. So thank you for introducing that. Our yoga jaya. A subject very dear to my heart and something that our guest speaker, our guest scholar, Jasthirji, has been speaking and working on for quite some time, is the pluralistic aspect of the Hindu and Indian traditions, which unites most of the Dharmic traditions together in one root. So Jasthirji has some words that he's going to share with us. Uh, Jasthirji is also doing a great deal of work on the 1984 issue and trying to get beyond it and hopefully towards moving towards a, a, a reconciliation and a, a peaceful and a, a tranquil state uh, with regard to that troublesome issue. So just thank you, thank you so much. submerged in what is uh, modernism and we fail to see them. My topic is uh, Indian pluralism and its Vedic roots. I'm not a scholar of the Vedas so I apologize if my understanding is mistaken and I will be very open to any criticism or corrections. <coughs> we live in a world of nation states in a period in which democracy and secularism <coughs> are considered as the most effective political systems of governance. This is promoted by international institutions such as the United Nations, by Western countries who have even gone to war, such as in Iraq, to impose it, and uh, India too uh, is a secular democ democracy. We need to understand uh, the roots of the nation state and secularism to understand the context of my uh, proposition of pluralism. Both the nation state and secularism are deeply embedded and involved in European history when the schismatic conflicts between the different Christian uh, denominations, the Protestants and the Catholics, ended up in uh, bloody wars for a no number of centuries. And the challenge by the kings against the Holy Roman Empire led to the fragmentation of European into ethnic dominated uh, nation states and eventually. Uh, the challenge by rational thinkers against the dogma held by the church. We heard about the Fatal theory, which led to uh, the demise of uh, the church doctrines in the public space. Hence, Europe took the path of what's called secularism, or the neutral space in which uh, religion or belief became a personal system, and the uh, public sphere was dominated by what it calls a more or less an atheistic system. Now, India adopted secularism in 1947. It was challenged by some legislators, and immediately Indian politicians said, uh, we have Indian secularism here. Now, there is no context to Indian secularism. There isn't a body of scholarly work behind it. I cannot find, for instance, a philosophy or a book on what constitutes ethics in, of Indian secularism. I know what constitutes ethics in Western <coughs> secularism, such as Rawls and people like uh, Rousseau and others. Um, it is at best a concessionary secularism in which some religious communities have forced the government to give concessions and the accommodation is called uh, Indian secularism. But India does have a response to uh, what the modern nation state is facing. The modern state, nation state is no longer a nation. <coughs> it is a state of multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multilinguistic, multi-religious communities. It doesn't have the tools to deal with it. It doesn't have the philosoph philosophical concept to deal with it. And secularism is fast becoming a past, past and pace. Uh, there are attempts such as multiculturalism, integration, assimilation to try and 
compared to come to terms with this multiplicity of communities. Yet in India, we can see for thousands of years there's always been an answer and there's always been a very successful model of the pluralistic governance in the Indian political systems apart from the 20th century. And my uh, Indian civilization, uh, I think Indian pluralism can trace its roots uh, to Vedic teachings, at least in the form of evidence. Uh, the most the much quoted uh, stanza, Ekam Satvipra Bhagupi Vedanta, which is truth is one which sages describe it by many descriptions, provides the framework of what has dominated the political sphere in Indian history as pluralism. It may be a matter of contention whether the proposition of truth in this sentence is also wider than the truth contained within the Vedas, or is it confined to the truth as the Vedas hold? In other words, can the truth so, is also the truth described by Abrahamic tradition, by Buddhism, by Jaina, Dharma, and Sikhi, or Kabbalah? Or is this, a, is this sentence only stated as different paths and ways to perceive the truth expressed in the Vedas? Now, my position is that it does not really matter, because it may be that the sentence refers to different paths and methods of realizing the truth according to the Vedas. However, it established a very important principle which influenced the general attitude of Indians through the ages. What this proposition led to was the lack of protracted violent schismatic conflicts within the different Vedic belief systems or against what within Vedic Hinduism are called Gnostic systems. Indeed, there have been disputes and debates within the followers of the many six uh, schools of thought within Vedas, uh, but they have never ended up resulted in the bloody wars that we see in Europe and in the Middle East. The Vedic principle has influenced the general attitude of Indians to other traditions as well, belief systems and systems of inquiry. It is strengthened by another idea that traces its concept to Asian India. This is the idea of enlightenment or the realization of truth. Now, it is interesting that the word enlightenment has two different meanings in two different civilizations. In Western history, enlightenment was the freedom from the constraints of revelation, of belief, and triumph of human reason over church dogma. It led to ideas such as human rights, liberalism, and invention exponential development of science. In Indian civilization, enlightenment is the realization of the ultimate truth, which cannot then be expressed in any form of human communication, such as language, music, etc. It is the stage of Brahmgya, uh, in Sikhi we call Brahmgyan. The beauty of this is that by putting knowledge of ultimate truth beyond the limits of human communication, a human being is left mute in expressing the truth. This means no one can then impose his or her knowledge of the truth upon others. And the path of realizing the truth is called fun. The road to enlightenment is through a process of reason and intuition. It is, in an, and I, 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 I uh, forgive me if I have understood, misunderstood this, it is vividly, in my opinion, stated in that moment when Lord Krishna tries to persuade Arjuna of the need to go to war against his relatives in the Mahabharata. When Arjuna is not persuaded by intellectual argument, then Lord Krishna presents himself in altogether in another avatar of form. It is a momentary instance, but Arjuna cannot describe that, nor, as I believe, is that description elaborated in the text. This is the moment of enlightenment that which Arjuna bows to his karma and, to, and accepts of his role in the world. Is that truth which is beyond our ability to communicate in words, in, in letters, and in music. And so these two concepts, one is of Bahuta, one is of ultimate truth being beyond our communication skills, has, have enabled Indians to coexist with different traditions, including atheism and agnosticism. So, and these principles also inform other traditions in Indian civilization, whether it's Buddhism or Jaina or Sikhism. They all share this sort of a, a, a principle, fundamental concept of that the truth is ultimately realized in all words and literature, and we, we coexist with each other. By avoiding intellectual absolutism, the Vedic philosophers did not contest science in Indian civilization. No Indian scientist in history has ever faced death or persecution or demonization. <laughs> so, 
in one of the longest period of the good kings, the Gupta dynasty, many scientists, uh, my scientific minds in words such as Aryabhat. See, it is also evidence of this pluralistic public space that the Mauryan dynasty, brought into power by the famous Chanakya, who was a Brahmin, had three successive kings with different belief system. Chandragupta Maurya remained Hindu, but on application became a Jain. If Bindusura followed Ajavita, while his successor Ashoka became Buddhist. Now, there was no attempt at any time during these episodes, unlike European or Christian or Middle East history, uh, Middle East history, to impose one system to the political process. In fact, all these three things, uh, we gave donations to other systems to coexist. In conclusion, the Vedic concept of Babuda has much wider appeal in today's world. It gave rise to Indian pluralism and history, where different belief systems, including atheism and exorcism, have coexisted without any state, without anyone stating a claim to monopoly of the public space, space and absolute knowledge. And it is very relevant today as well. In the, in the, in the modern state, which is multi-ethnic, multicultural, uh, multi-religious, multi-racial, which is why I believe India has the answer when nobody else has. But as uh, Professor Sen said, this is a moment in India's history where either the present government and those who support it and begin to revive the principles that have sustained Indian civilization and made it so great, and bring it to the fore in the system of governance, and then guide the world, or it may just be another passing phase in the I leave it at that. Thank you very much. Just let me thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. You just reminded me of one of uh, the phrases from the Upanishads, with the, which is associated with Gandhiji. Now that is that be wary of your thoughts, they become your ideas, your ideas become your speech, your speech becomes your nature, your nature becomes your actions. And so if you have a look at the actions of Hindus around the world, we're known for gentle, peaceful coexistence, hard work, scholarship, and integration, if anything. So if you de deconstruct that backwards, you go from our actions to our nature, from our nature to our speech, from our speech to our ideas, and our ideas to our thoughts. If you apply the same process to civilizations and belief systems, and then trace their actions, you will run across the same process, and it will come back to thoughts, which are really in need of scrutiny. So again, scholars uh, need to come to the fore with courage and, uh, uh, and push this forward.